Welcome to the Catbird Quilts. I'm Kathy Martin and today's video, well, it's going to be different than some of the other ones I've done. Part quilt story, part how-to, part confessional, <laughs> who knows, but stay with me because there's one thing we know, I have a lot to say about it. So if you've been with me for my other videos, you may remember that I started a fall quilt uh, based on the comment of one of our viewers who said, I see a fall quilt in your future. And sure enough, there was a fall quilt in my future. So I found a pattern that I liked and um, put together a practice block, which more on that in a moment and realized that I did not like the colors and fabrics that I had chosen. And so I have a previous video about that very thing. Um, and so if you want to check that out, you can. For those of you who have seen it, let me just start by showing you the block that was and the block that is, or the quilt top that is. So let me show you that. So to my left, I have the whole entire quilt top folded up so you can see what one block looks like. And to my right was the practice block. Um, and you can see the, the one that I settled on is the eight colors as opposed to the 16. I felt like these colors in the practice block were not really working harmoniously together. And so I simplified and minimized the number of colors and fabrics and ended up with the block and now quilt top on the left. If you can kind of see for yourself, the practice block is actually still really lovely. But my hunch was that as I did more and more of them, uh, it would perhaps have a disjunct colorway. Whereas the one to my left is, because I simplified it, it's a little more harmonious. In all fairness to the quilt designer, the original pattern called for 48 different colors and fabrics. And um, I had made the decision for the colorway before I really pick the pattern. And this is one of the things about, do you do colors and fabrics first and pattern second, or do you do pattern first and colors and fabrics second? And so I had narrowed it down to two different patterns and ultimately ended up on this one, which is Sunset by Julie Popa, P-O-P-A. And um, so in her original design in all fairness and kudos to her, if you use 48 different colors and fabrics, if you have a color that's slightly an outlier or even four or five, because of how many they, there are, it gets lost in the shuffle of the whole colorway. Um, so if I had actually followed her pattern <laughs> to the T and had 48 colors and fabrics, then it probably wouldn't have bothered me so much. Uh, but it did kind of bother me because I had just these, I wouldn't say few, but these um, 16. And so I made a decision to simplify. And a nod to the commenters who have said, you know, go more, not less. But for me, as a quilter and my own artistic style, I tend to like simpler rather than more complex or um, elaborate. I'm going to keep my practice block out and move my quilt top away so I can talk about some things that I learned on my practice block. All right, so here comes all of the show and tell, <laughs> confession, <laughs> everything. We're going to do it with the practice block. The quilt pattern is was a little different for me. It's um, it's a different kind of design than the ones I've done before, and it had some components that I had not, I have actually not quilted before. Uh, so, uh, for example, there's a partial seam in this quilt pattern. The 
strips are sewn together and then sewn with pieces that make it be on the bias, which is on the diagonal of the fabric as opposed to with the grain, uh, which can pose some challenges um, just because, um, because of the way it stretches and gives on the bias. I had this plan to use linen, this one, that, this practice block that you see, this white, which actually looked more cream until I had it all taken apart and sewn together, but is linen, which has a lot of stretch of its own. I was um, talking to my husband about practice blocks and how I don't really, I haven't really thought of myself as someone who makes a practice block to see if it's going to work. And he said, you make practice blocks, they're just called quilts. <laughs> and that's so true. I'm, I'm one to just jump in and make the whole thing. And it really, I just learn on what I'm making. And um, well, I, that reminds me, had a friend whose license plate was Semper Reformanda, um, which is Latin for always reforming. And I feel like maybe if I had a, actually my motto should be order is joy. We know this, but it's a thing. <laughs> but I could always, I, I could also have um, Semper Doctrina, which is always learning. And I love that. And I'm, it's learning is my favorite. But when you jump in, to the deep end of the pool, sometimes learning to swim is, is challenging. So same thing with quilting. Sometimes I jump in and I'm learning on the fly. This time I just happened to make one block and I made course corrections before I had a whole quilt as my practice block. What I have found, and I had practiced what I preached, which is with my linen, I had actually starched it and laid it out and let it dry overnight so that it was on grain and starched so it would hold the shape that I cut it in. What I was not prepared for was how stretchy it still is, even with starch and even on grain. And in this particular block, because there are these triangular pieces right here, all around the edge. And then this is cut square on the grain, but it does end up on the bias in the corner. Um, and that posed some challenges. Um, so a couple of things, just as a side note, if you choose to do this, if you see this video and go, Ooh, I love the way that looks. And PS, I love the way it looks. It's a beautiful design. The cutting instructions for this piece that I call an arrow, this right here, you can see this, this piece starts off as a rectangle and in the direction she talks about cutting here, and here. So you're cutting on a 45 degree angle to the middle and then another 45 degree angle to the middle. And I have to tell you, I was really nervous that I was going to get my angle off and that it wasn't going to be straight. I'm actually going to turn this and show you another one because actually, well, it's kind of making the point that I was saying, do you see how that's kind of gotten stretched out of shape? It's like it's pulling up. That's the nature of being cut on the bias. It just, it pulls, it stretches. And so now that doesn't even look like I cut it straight, which I may not have, but I think I did. So let me turn this so you can see one that's not stretched. That's a little better. The directions were to cut here and here. And what I discovered was that I could fold that rectangle right down the middle and bisect it and then make one cut instead of two. So I just did the one cut on that 45 degree angle. And then that way I knew that it was the same on both sides. So it's symmetrical. Ooh, even just handling that, stretch that out. That was one of the learning experiences I had both working with linen and doing those cuts. So if you can, shortcut. <laughs>
Oh, that was a dad pun. And make one cut rather than two, you're probably going to have a more accurate cut. So I learned that on this practice block. I also learned, which I already knew this, I, sh I feel like it's one of those shame on me, I should have known better. I don't know if you can see in the shot how warpy this strip is. This is flannel. And flannel, though it is very soft and really especially lovely in a completed quilt, it is surprisingly stretchy. It's I feel like it's the... Um, the dark secret that nobody talks about. <laughs> it's kind of a, the best kept secret, but not in the good way. A lot of flannels are very stretchy, and this was the case. I did starch it, but I obviously didn't starch it heavy enough. I probably could have benefited from a very lightweight or featherweight fusible interfacing to stabilize it. So it it is, whoo, it's kind of warpy. It's a little janky right there, uh, which I noticed when I did my practice block. Again, the value of the practice block, I will be told, this is a confession. I don't like to practice. I like to start something and do it. And I want to do it perfectly the first time I do it, <laughs> which is, now that I'm saying that, I still wonder I'm not blushing. That's so ridiculous and unrealistic. And a lot of times I don't do it perfectly, but it's close enough that it'll get by and I fix before the next block. I like make course corrections within myself and my expectations. But if this quilt taught me one thing, it's the value of practice and making a practice block or going into a project with the idea, I may not love this and it's okay to make a change and take a different course. The two fabrics that I thought I was going to use that I started with actually were the ones that I needed to abandon to make the block work from a color standpoint. And that also is hard for me to do, more confession. We laugh and say I get married to an idea or whatever. It's hard for me to let it go. My youngest daughter says, are you married to it? Uh, <laughs> and sometimes I'm like, yes, I'm married to this fabric. But I had, when I finally let go with the idea of that orange does not have to be in this quilt, then the rest of the fabrics came together. So that was another um, thing that happened with the practice block. Um, I also had not had any experience with partial seams. And uh, I reached out to my friend who is the pharmacist also, and quilter, knitter, crocheter also. And we were talking about the whole partial seam thing and her comment was, and I think this is spot on, it's different. It's, it's not that it's especially hard, it's just different. And if you have never done a partial seam, um, well, let me explain it if you've never done a partial seam. The center square is sewn on all four sides. Obviously, it's in the center. The block, in most blocks, you can see like this is a block or this is a segment and this is a segment. And so you sew it to the square on top and bottom and left and right, which you do that here, but there is no one big piece that will sew to that edge. It, each one overlaps the other. So this strip appears to overlap this strip, which appears to overlap lap this strip. And so there's no place where there's one seam that goes the whole width, or in this case, the diagonal of the block. So what that means is you have to sew part of it. Uh, so this square to part of this section so that you can sew this section, which allows you to sew this section, and that allows you to sew this section. And then what you have to do is join that last little bit. And maybe I'll do a video down the road about partial seams, but I think you can, hopefully you can visualize that. Before, this is, a, this is one section, this right here. And when you go to sew the square, you sew it, this square, to this part, but only to right here. And then that allows that seam to happen. 
and so on and so forth. The tricky thing, and now I'll turn it over, is when you get back, you have to complete out the seam. And that is not hard, but it's a little tricky. Uh, I have a friend that says tricksy instead of tricky, and in this case, it's a little tricksy. What you have to do is match up your seam where you started. Um, and what makes that tricky, and actually we'll, I can point to any of these sides, and whoo, goodness gracious, it's a good thing this is not going in the t final quilt, because look at that. Holy mackerel, there's only like a sixteenth of an inch holding that linen to that piece. Whew, my goodness. Lining up and sewing on a seam that has already been sewn in and of itself is not especially hard, except that it's attached at the other end. So I hope that makes sense. So when you come back to complete out a seam, you don't start at the very beginning of the seam, you pick up where you left off. So trying to stay on that line can sometimes be a little bit challenging because it's anchored at the other end. Um, and if it's a really big block that you're doing your partial seam on, there's some wiggle room there and it's not nearly as challenging. When you get this size and maybe smaller, um, having that pulling on this side while you're trying to complete out that seam, what can happen is it can make a little, so I must have fixed it, but it can get a little bit of a, like a bump or a little pucker where you have come and completed out your seam. If I take my seam ripper, which I'm getting right now, actually you can see this was the first seam and then I sewed this and then I sewed this and I came around and sewed this. Now I have to finish out this. If you take your seam ripper and just pop that little seam right there and you can see these two seams that I did um, because I actually backed up and and sewed the whole thing. So what I did is I broke this seam apart so that I could actually just seam the whole thing without it tugging, if that makes sense. That may be a little more detailed than I intended to be right there, and it may not be clear. And if that's okay and you're interested in a how to sew partial seams, we can do that video in the future. Just leave a comment. So I made the two blocks, um, felt like they did not work together. And so I decided that I would just make throw pillows out of them. So let's change over to the, this is the, I don't know what this part of the video <laughs> is called, but I wanna talk to you about making throw pillow. So here is, so same block as a throw pillow. And first of all, gosh, surprising how much smaller it looks when it's puffy. Um, that's just one of those Kathy Martin parenthetical phrases there. But what I did is, uh, and I trimmed my blocks, by the way. Um, I just don't like those rough edges. And so I trimmed it down to 16 and a half on each side and then knowing that I would lose a half inch in seam allowance. So this is a 16 inch pillow. Of course, Semper Doctrina, I learned on this process. So now I have my practice block on top of batting, on top of uh, just a plain white fabric. Uh, by the way, I recently saw that if you have fabric that you have purchased that you just can't find anything to do with it. And it is a reminder every time you look in your fabric stash, like, ugh, I paid good money for that fabric and I'm just not going to use it. Use it as the backing in a throw pillow because no one's ever going to see it. It's going to be on the inside of the pillow. And then it's been put to use, it's not wasted, and you don't have to figure out how to integrate it into a project. I loved that idea. For those of you, again, who have been with me, you know that I do not like the quilt sandwich. I don't like basting at all. 
And I pin based because that's what I learned to do. And so I have not really ever found a better way. Although lots of folks have suggested that I try, probably because I loathe it so much <laughs> and talk about how I loathe it so much. But if you also are a pin baster, let me tell you, spray basting for small projects, the way to go. Because you don't have any pins in your way. You don't have to do all of that. I mean, it would be easy to pin it, but then because it's a small project, you're working around your pins. So I, on my pillow that I finished, I spray basted the batting to the backing, and then I spray basted the quilt top, quilt block, to the batting. More little pieces that I cannot not pick. And then once you get it spray basted, and you can put a hot dry iron on it to help the glue set. So just that's the tip and trick kind of thing. And I quilted the throw pillow just along the lines, I actually stitched in the ditch, which I have not done a lot of that. So much harder than it looks like it's gonna be, but very effective. So I stitched in the ditch right along the, I just mirrored the lines of the quilt and of the quilt design, which again, beautiful design. And what it did is it highlights that strip, but then it provides a little bit of texture where the two strips cross each other. And also in the middle, it puts a nice little textural. So even though the linen was a bear to work with, especially on the bias, uh, in the end result, it provided a lot of nice texture. I'll do this other block exactly like this one in the quilting and put it together and I'll have a lovely throw pillow. I watched a lot of YouTube videos on how to make an envelope pillow which I actually knew how to make an envelope pillow. Uh, and if you've not heard that term before, think pillow sham. It's just overlapping fabric on the back. Let me show you. So this is the envelope. So it just pulls apart and you stick your pillow up in there and get it all in the corners. And then you tuck in like an envelope and then pull up the top. What I did not find, even just plain Googling, not YouTubing, is how to know how much fabric to leave. So I understood the concept of I need this piece of fabric for the top, and I need this piece of fabric for the bottom, and I need enough for it to cover itself so it doesn't, you know, show the guts of the pillow <laughs> like someone who's eaten too much at Thanksgiving and their shirt's pulling up. But... <laughs> With their little gut hanging out. <laughs> but like if I, I found a couple that would say for an 18 inch pillow use la 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 amount of fabric and I got to thinking about that and I'm like I need a ratio. I need a percentage. I need a, there's got to be a formula for how much. So that way no matter what size pillow I make if this was a 24 inch pillow, I would know how much fabric. And so I made one up and I'm gonna share it with you. So if you decide to do this, it seems to work. So you measure the length of the pillow and then you multiply by two thirds and that's how much fabric you need for each piece. And that way you have a whole, so you can actually see for yourself because here's the line of what's underneath. So there's a third of the top and a third of the bottom and a third covers each each part of the middle. So you do two thirds and two thirds and then you get a third covered in the middle. So now even if the pillow was like really puffy, there's still a lot of room and it's not gonna poke out. So if you have been wondering or if you're gonna make a throw pillow, you can use my made up formula. <laughs> Height of pillow, times two thirds, and that's the size of both your top and bottom pieces. And then you're covered, literally. Also, before I move on, 
Isn't this an interesting color? I don't know that I would say it was pretty. And out of context, I might actually say it's ugly. But with that fall colors, it is so pretty. And it is a pillowcase that I got from the thrift store. So this is that reminder to keep your keep an open mind when you go to the thrift store. So if you see a really ugly brown pillowcase, you can think, oh, I can use that in my fall throw pillow that I made from a practice quilt that was kind of disastrous. So you've got the confession, you've got the how-to, some of the quilt story. I wanted to show you the backing fabric that I chose and the binding fabric that I chose. And I have been piecing a lot of my quilt backs lately, but for this quilt, because it is a very strong, specific design, this quilt had some challenges. I really was just ready to have a nice, lovely back that I didn't have to spend a whole lot of energy on. So I picked this, I, I say I, I, along with my youngest, went to the local quilt store and we looked at, I think we looked at every fabric in this color palette in the whole store. And we settled on this one. It actually is a, it's called Hope Blooms. It's a Moda fabric um, and it has this lovely little quote on it. Anyway, um, and it just seemed to really work. Uh, it's it's in the orange family, obviously, but it's not. It's kind of like it's the middle between this red and kind of vermilion and then this, this golden pumpkin. It's like it fits right there in the middle. And across the pattern are these little, just little checks. There's some green, there's some navy, there's that darker red. And we both agree that it looked like it was made for it. And then to kind of cap it all off, we settled on a nice brown that just really drives home the point as if it were not already so plain that it is the fall quilt. So I may or may not end up doing a for real live quilt story on this when it's all said and done. Um, so if, if I don't, you'll be able to have seen the backing and the binding. I'm gonna hold up the quilt so you can see the look of it um, and how it came together. There was a final thing that I wanted to say. I was talking to another quilting friend about um, matching up seams on the diagonal, which you can see that's at every join. Um, it, you know, it comes together here on this seam and they're all diagonals and she, um, asked me, I did not press my seams open. I pressed them to the side. And so one block is pressed to the dark side and the other block is pressed to the light side. And she said, why don't you just press them open? Great question. Besides the fact that I really do not enjoy pressing seams open, which probably is the real story. To me, matching seams with two open seams is actually fairly challenging. Um, you have, I guess you don't have to do a lot of pins, but for me, uh, when I put two open seams together, I feel like I have to put a lot of pins to really anchor it in the right place. And if I get to go in too fast when I'm sewing, it will still pull and I want them to line up. Even though, yes, it's on the diagonal, I actually press my seams to the side and the opposite side so that I could have a nested seam, which, you know, how I feel about a nested seam. What I did is I did actually line up the color, colors of each block so that there was a continuous line like lattice. And I'm just, I don't know why I'm doing this in stages, but I'm doing this in stages. And then I'm getting to the place where I don't know how I'm gonna hold up this whole thing because it's actually really big. Maybe I'll just drape. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the fall quilt and I do think it turned out very lovely. I may have veered ever so slightly from the original design, uh, which is still really beautiful. Uh, but I, you know, you have to make your own quilt. You just have to make it your own way. 
So that's my fall quilt while it's still fall <laughs> because Lord knows by the time I get it backed and bound or backed and quilted and bound, it probably won't be fall anymore. So I wanted to share it with you before it got too late. A lot of you have asked to see the whole thing. Um, maybe we'll get one good B-roll shot where it's all in the whole frame. Thanks for coming along with me today with this kind of herky-jerky video about my fall quilt. I'm Kathy Martin. This is the Catbird Quilts. Thanks for watching.